Hello, my friend. My name is Byron, and I'm from the BJJ Brick Podcast. I want to thank you for checking out the podcast on the YouTube channel here. It's a weekly show dedicated to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and having fun on the mats. Enjoy the show. Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your jiu-jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is episode 241. Uh, this week we have an interview with Diego Gamanal. He's the uh, owner and head instructor of Brazilian top team San Antonio. He's a third degree black belt, and uh, I really enjoyed doing the interview. I'm on here with my friend Byron and my good friend Gary. How are you guys doing today? You know, I'm doing fabulous, especially since you said Byron was your friend and I was your good friend. You know, that makes me feel special. I, I really appreciate that, Joe. Oh, well, you know, do, do what I can to keep your uh, self-opinion where it needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I bet Byron paid you, but hey, I don't mind. <laughs> I, no, I think Gary, you'd be the one that paid him to... To talk you up a little bit there, but yeah, I'm really no, excited I don't for need this. That. <laughs> <laughs> but you appreciate it though. Yes, yeah, Joe's a good guy. Excited about this episode. This is one of the Beach of Jibrick extra episodes. This is coming out the first of the month. Uh, the first week of the month, we'll do. Uh, we're trying to do two episodes that week, and so you'll have this one, and then on the normal Monday, you'll have the the regular episode come out. So enjoy your double dose of BJJ Brick this week. And Joe, is Diego your instructor or uh, another Brazilian top team instructor in the area? He's my instructor's instructor. Okay, awesome. So yep. my, we got the my big time on. Yeah, he, so he trained, my instructor trained in San Antonio, I think from the time he was blue till, and then till he was brown, and then he got his black, and right after that came down and opened the school. That's awesome. Definitely can't wait to hear from uh, Diego here shortly. Yeah, that's that's going to be great, and then you kind of working uh, your way up the chain as far as uh, people have been training in a long time and, and you're getting your instructor's instructor. That's really cool, and uh, looking forward to sharing that interview with everybody. Uh, also, well, you know what, what else is really cool? Byron? What's really cool, Gary? The BJJ Brick event, the first ever BJJ Brick event, and as like I'm saying, Byron's calling it the Brick of Palooza. We don't have a <laughs> normal name for it; we just call it the BJJ Brick event. But June 22nd, June 23rd, June 24th, 2018, Wichita, Kansas. Do not miss it. Uh, 22nd, open mat. Uh, all this happens at Fox Fitness. Uh, you know they were nice enough to uh, donate their space. Jake is Jake Fox and Kim Fox are great friends of ours. Uh, and uh, definitely letting us use the use their gym. Uh, so 22nd, Friday, open mat. June 23rd is the meat and potatoes day. We have two previous guests, two seminars, not one seminar, not three seminars, but two seminars. Tim Sled, Roly Delgado. Um, so who else to learn from but those two guys, you know, two legends, two incredible people. I can't wait. I know a lot of people can't wait. And uh, you, you don't want to miss it. June 24th. Byron, Joe, and I will teach you a little bit of stuff. You can't miss June 24th either. You do not want to miss the BJJ Brick event, June 22nd to June 24th, Wichita, Kansas. Yep. We're still putting kind of the curriculum together for the 24th, uh, talking a little bit with Gary about what he might want to show, and he's got some uh, co cards up his sleeve that he's going to be revealing and, and helping you guys and really helping me because I don't understand all the things that he does to me all the time. So this will be nice. And I'm uh, also kind of figuring out what I want to show and talking to a few of my teammates and saying, well, well, you know, would this be good or would this be better? Just kind of getting, uh, we want to bring you our best and, and that'll be on the 24th. So it's a, it's a long weekend. It's a full week end, and, and uh, we're looking forward to having people here from around Wichita and coming in from outside of Wichita. If you're coming in from outside of Wichita, uh, send me an email at bjjbrick at gmail.com. We'll try to help you with some of the details about staying here. Make sure you have a great time. Uh, Gary, I'm starting to think Byron's got some ulterior motives here. It sounds like he's asking you to teach certain things just so he can figure the game out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that ulterior motive won't work because I'm going to show the improper way to do it, uh. really terrible ways to do it. 
And, well, I mean, a lot of people do think everything I show is terrible, but I'm going to show this especially for Byron, and that way when he uses it, it's just going to work to my advantage. So I've already figured it out, but thank you, Joe. He's always one step ahead of me. I got your back, Gary. Literally. (laughs) And we've got your back if you're in your first year of training or haven't even started yet. We have an audio book. It's $11.99. It's it's an audiobook made by me, produced by me. Uh, it's about two and a half hours long, and I'll walk you through everything from finding the right gym to what to do your first month of training all the way to if you want to compete and what to expect and how to get trained for that. Uh, check it out. There'll be a link in the show notes. There's also a link in the show notes to the uh, BJJ Brick event. Gary's calling it the Brickapalooza. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so there's a little picture there. Click on that. There's details, and you can sign up and even uh, get your tickets before they sell out. Uh, check them out. Uh, check everything out in the show notes. Go to just bjjbrick.com. If you can't find the show notes, it'll be there. Really easy, we guys. Could, yep, we could call it the Chokathon. <laughs> well, that might have a certain ring to it. Yeah, the snap attack. <laughs> <laughs> Gary's in charge of the name. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I've never been in marketing before. It's pretty much going to rhyme no matter what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we have a tip of the week, and I'd like to hear how you guys think about this or if you use it or acknowledge it as a as a good tip, even though it might be challenging to utilize. But uh, we say tip of the week, but really it's tip of the month because this is a BJ Brick Extra episode, and we kind of run this format differently where we normally have a quote of the week. We have a tip. So tip of the month? Um, basically, the tip is try to eat healthier the days you train. You'll see better performance on the mat and also, you know, pick, cleaning up your diet for, you know, two to four to five times a week is just a natural benefit um, if you're able to do this and, and be motivated to have a clean diet those days. So, guys, what do you what do you think about this? Do, are you, do you guys uh, try this at all? I know I do a little bit. Yeah, I, I am trying to eat healthy in general. And uh, for me, actually, um on days I train, my my eating can get thrown off. I do some lunch classes, and if I'm not careful, I won't eat till the middle of the day on those days. So um, I don't necessarily try and eat different. I just make sure that I don't make any mistakes. And see, I'm the other way. I don't necessarily change my eating habits. I, I know I should. On days where I do eat better, I do perform better. Um, but I really like to eat. And... Uh, what happens sometimes is I'll eat a really big lunch or I'll eat too close to time of training and I'll pay for it on the mat. Um, you know, that's something I really need to, you know, obey this tip of the week. And uh, I would definitely get more out of my training. So I am the bad guy out of us three on that one. So I do need to do a better job and, and I'll have better training sessions and I'll learn more. Sometimes if I'm, I'm hungry before class... I think it's better to just skip that meal or postpone it for several hours and train hungry. And, Gary, you're hungrier when you're hungry. Uh, literally, perhaps? No, um, but I don't mind working out with an empty stomach, feeling like uh, I'm going to be really hungry when I get home. I think that that's an okay thing. It kind of reminds me of the, the one year that I wrestled because, you know, I'd wrestle and I'd be hungry while I was wrestling trying to make weight. And How did you do that year? I did terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to bring that up, Byron. <laughs> Whoops, that just kind of slipped out of there uh, as soon as it could. No, uh, and, and we could talk about this as well. It's hard to wrestle for one year starting like in, in junior high or high school because all the other kids have wrestled for a lot of time. It's like jumping into a purple belt division. Even you know, kids have eight, ten years of experience, and you're walking in there you know, watching WWF, looking for the top rope, and there's not even a rope involved. I didn't understand what was going on. But, you know, if you've never tried grappling hungry, on a, you know, grappling on an empty stomach, try it and see if it, if it affects the way you grapple. It doesn't affect my performance at all. The only negative is I'll, I'll be ravenous when I get home, and I need to be sure I have something healthy when I get home. I'm really good about not stopping and picking up fast food on the way home, but whatever's in the fridge, I'm going to eat it. So if I've set myself up for success earlier by having you know good, healthy foods in the fridge, that's what I'm going to eat. And it may not have to taste the best or be you know the, the most you know fattening or unhealthy food. If it's healthy food and that's all I have, 
I'm going to eat that and it's going to be great. Uh, so it just kind of helps build that appetite. But uh, I don't know. I'd recommend trying it at least once or twice and seeing if it if it affects you in a negative way. Some people get a little bit more grumpy when they're hungry. You know, like Gary would have a Snickers bar. He turns into a diva. And uh, he's just on himself. He's kind of like a, a grumpy Betty White or Roseanne Barr, aren't you, Gary? Yeah, definitely Roseanne Barr. But, you know, the crazy thing is you were talking about you're ravenous and you go home and you make sure you don't eat fast food. I am really doing bad here because uh, Byron and I, we rolled this morning. Byron, did you eat beforehand? I don't think I ate this morning before I came in to the train. See, I had a big bowl of cereal. Yeah. Um, And then afterwards, I came home real quick to pick my son up to go eat hamburgers and fries. And then when we were done, I stopped by Burger or Dairy Queen to get a blizzard. Nice. So uh, I ate terrible, but it was afterwards at least. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's I awesome. have failed this this podcast this week. <sighs> that's transparency right there. That's yep. true. <laughs> yeah, I promise I'll do better sometime. Sometime. One of these days for that day, Gary will do a little bit better. That's funny, but I mean, it's just, it is what it is. If you could, if you could tie in your training, which you're going to be doing anyway, to eating healthier that day, I think it makes your dieting process a little bit easier. Uh, look for patterns there that, that could help you have a cleaner diet. And I think you'd be better off. And I do agree with you guys. Uh, I, days I eat better, hydrate better. I do train better. I do train better on an empty stomach versus eating you know, a meal before I train or, you know, within a couple hours before I train, it is something that is, is going to be very beneficial to you to train, to learn, to have better practices. Yeah. I don't know what you guys think. I'm not a nutritionist, but, uh, I'm wondering if you're on trying to do the low carb thing and, and maybe drop some weight, if you don't want to ease up on that a little bit, the days you train. That would make sense. Give you a little bit of energy to, uh, roll around on the mat. It just might something to think about i think the on that or on any of this stuff it's an experiment with your own body and your own uh foods and intakes everybody's different and you know you might try you know low carbs and rolling and see if you feel like you're any different or you might try a little bit more than normal carbs and rolling and see if that's any different and you know give it a little bit of time you know maybe try that for a week or something like that but i think the idea of experimenting with your diet or your sleep maybe getting more sleep you roll better uh, maybe getting, you know, maybe you get tons of sleep, so maybe a little bit less and, and it would be okay. But just be open to kind of tinkering with things and seeing if it helps you on the, on the mat or off the mat. Maybe you have a clearer mind at work or something like that as well. Yeah. And, you know, you've talked about that numerous times before, you know, you, you're a big proponent of experimenting, you know, <laughs> and, and we've talked about that before and it's great, great, uh, great advice, Myron. And although, uh, for the listeners, although Gary and Byron did not go to nutritional school, they did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. <laughs> hey, you get a free breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Problem is, I had about 1,400 calories for breakfast. Somebody else who's always on it and uh, has the knowledge of somebody who stays at the Holiday Inn is Diego. Uh, Joe, what can we expect during this interview? You know, uh, we talked about everything from his early days at training in Brazil as a, a young man and his uh, working his way up through the belts and uh, his competition career. And uh, we talked a little bit about kids' jiu-jitsu, a little bit about uh, uh, how to run a jiu-jitsu school. I, it was a great interview, and I think the listeners are going to like it. All right, here we go. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He is such a polite driver, he always signals when he changes lanes. This often carries over to BJJ if he has been driving a lot. If you're careful to watch his left hand before he performs a sweep, you will see his fingers flick up or down to indicate which direction he is going to sweep. Just before he executes the sweep, he will check to make sure the mat is clear of other grapplers. He can sneak up on a ninja in daytime. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do... I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. Uh, BJJ Brick listeners, I have on the phone with me Diego Gaminal. 
He's third degree black belt. He's the head instructor and the owner at Brazilian Top Team San Antonio. Diego, how are you doing tonight? Good, my friend. Good. For us, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing good, too. So you just got done teaching class, correct? Yeah, I just finished the class right now. What did you teach tonight? How did it go? So it was good. Today I was working like some side control, chokers, north-south. So it was pretty good. I got a full class today. So the gym been busy all day today. I huh. think the weather started to help. <laughs> yeah, the weather's nice now, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, just for our listeners who might not know who you are, can you give us a brief introduction? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, yeah, for sure. So my name is Diego Gamonal. I'm a third degree black belt on the Ricardo Marx from Brazilian Top Team Juiz de Fora, where is my hometown, and under also Murilo Bustamante, which is my coach as well. So I've been training all my, my whole life with my coach from white to black. And also always train with Coach Murilo Bustamante and Rio and his own gym. So you make a lot of camps together. So now I'm here in Texas, so I'm the head coach of BTT Texas. So I got my school right here in San Antonio. And you have like it's been growing in Texas very well with a couple of students, a couple of affiliations right here. Nice. Uh, how, how, old, how, how long have you been training? So I started to train in 1998. So it's 20 years, completing 20 years now. Good. That's, that's a good bit of time. Do you remember when you started to train? Why did you start to train? What prompted you to find a jiu-jitsu school? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's funny because, like, when I started to train in my hometown, like, nobody knew what jiu-jitsu was. Uh, it was brand new. But I always like, I always like to fight, so I get some fights in, on the school all the time, so in the streets, so, and then I always like to fight, so like, and I have a friend, so he invited me to do a jiu-jitsu, which like, I have no idea what is there. I, I was like 15 years old, and uh, I thought of something like ninja, you know, gonna do ninjitsu, I say, okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I get there, I rolling on the floor, I say, man, what's what's going on here? Like, nobody punch, nobody kick anybody. <laughs> and then, like, I just asked to do a class, and the next day I was training, and uh, I guess I never stopped after that. Nice. Now, yeah. I, I've heard that uh, at one point in Brazil, jiu-jitsu is kind of for maybe the affluent or the people with a little bit more money. Was it that way when you started? Yeah, so it, was, it was like a kind of pricey, you know, a very very hard to do jiu-jitsu so it's not that like because in brazil you like if you're gonna do some sports you're doing something cheaper so everybody plays soccer which you don't have to buy an outfit like complete outfit or everything else you know just have a ball and start playing which uh, to do jiu-jitsu was a kind of expensive so to to pay the membership fees and then you also have to get a gi so and the back in the day was not easy like today you have like thousand brands of gears, everybody selling gears, you know, like, was like one or two types of gears, brandies, and then you have to buy that was expensive at the time. So I remember, like, I have one gear to train every single day when I first started, like, for my whole white belt, I use the same gear every single day, sometimes, like, two times a day, I use the same gear. So I didn't even have time to wash. <laughs> Yeah. Has that changed over the years? Is jiu-jitsu becoming more accessible to the average guy in Brazil? Yes, yes, for sure. So in early 2000, jiu-jitsu explodes. So everywhere in Brazil now, they have a jiu-jitsu, every corner, every gym. So they have jiu-jitsu, which make the price going a little bit lower. But it's still like going to the good gyms in Brazil is still like kind of expensive. And and now it's, it's like the competition is more so we should make like more accessible no yeah now uh, it's it's popular in brazil to have uh, social projects and do jujitsu in some of the poorer neighborhoods is that something that you've been involved in or brazilian top teams been involved in any of that yeah so in brazil is it, they they do that a lot even master Molero bustamante he has his own social project in rio when his teacher like for the for the kids for free and then it's a it's a good group over there so the jiu-jitsu is getting very very popular in brazil you know it's it's good to see the growing nice 
Um, what was the Matt culture like back in the day? Uh, was it a pretty tough guy culture? Did they have the challenge matches, people coming off the street to see if Brazil Brazilian jiu-jitsu was real? It was like tough training, but it was very respectful. Like it's really, it's really rare somebody like show up at the gym and say want to challenge somebody, you know, if you, without knowing. Because they knew like it would be, it would be tough. And the training back in the day was really, really tough. Like, if you like to keep training, like, it's not a lot of people keep training there for a long time. I believe at that time because it was harder. Like, for you to keep training over there, man, you have to work, work it very hard. So it, it's, it's a kind of different today. So you're making the class more, like, a little bit easier for, like, all the types of people who wanted to, to train. But back in the day, is most like to compete, to fight. You know, like if you want, if you should get in the gym, man, you gotta be ready to fight because you, you wanna fight. So, and then because of that, like, it is really rare somebody get inside your gym to challenge anybody. I, I got gotcha. you. So I see that at uh, at your school, you have some boxing classes, you have some uh, MMA. Um, do you do you view that as kind of being separate from jujitsu, or do you view that as being part of jujitsu? No, it works like discipline is separate, but it is part of the MMA program. So uh, you have like uh, the whole training center here. We do have like a lifting room in the gym. You have a boxing, big boxing, uh, the jiu-jitsu. Also in the jiu-jitsu class, you have once a week a wrestling as well, which uh, try to be complete. I believe I believe everyone has to to do everything. Like you have to train gi, you have to train no gi, you have to play have a good guard you have to have a good takedown so even though you have to be a good striker you know at least to defend yourself if you need to punch or protect yourself to get a punch or kick nice i like that it's kind of an old school mentality i think but yeah, i, yeah, I really appreciate it yeah for sure that's that's the way i grew up training so back in the day it was like a, like back in the 90s he was training jiu-jitsu someday and then the coach show up in the class and say, okay, today everybody take the gear off and start, like, slapping children. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like, doing, like, crazy things like that to, to tough you up. I got to be ready, you know? Yes. And then uh, I think for that time, because Jiu-Jitsu was growing, they had to prove it was good. You know? Yeah. But, uh, today's are kind of different, you know? Yeah, it's different. Dif- di- you're in a different country, and it's a little bit different time. And so, do you find yeah. your do you find yourself trying to uh, find a happy medium between keeping jujitsu tough and uh, at the same time making it easy enough for students to keep going? Well, I try to yeah, I try to find the point where like I can have the tough guys tra- tough guys training, you know, prepare for the competition. But at the same time, I have a lot of guys who just train for self defense. Some guys want to just get in shape. Some guys just want to have fun with it. Like, uh, for me, the most important, uh, you learn the jiu-jitsu as a complex jiu-jitsu, but having fun. So if you're not having fun, what are you doing? Like, you have no reason to come back the next day. So I try to make everybody having fun during the class, you know, pushing hard. So, but you gotta, you gotta see like when you have to hold and when you have to push. You gotta be able to very, very close attention to that. Nice. Okay. Um, you're you're my coach's coach. Um, how long have you been Fernando's coach? Did he he came up and stayed with you when he came to America? Is that right? Yes. Yes. So Fernando started with me. He was really young. He's like, uh, I believe he was 13 years old, and he was a kid when training to me. And he trained to me a little while. He got his blue belt, and then he started going to me to train under my coach. So he's. After that, he trained under my coach and get all, pretty much all the belts under my coach. Was, we were training together. It was like a teammates. But I always had to like, help him to train. And he was under Ricardo as well. So when I, he moved to the United States, so he asked me to, I invited him to come over here. He was a brown belt at the time, training under my coach. I invited him to come over here. He like, he wanna try the experience, how it would be to live here and live with Jiu Jitsu. And he stayed with me for a couple of months, He's still tra- he training. And then I give the belt to him, the black belt. And then, but also I gave it like under 
my coach's name. So I just like me and my coach giving to him. So my coach wasn't him present to do it. He asked me to do that. So we give to him the black belt together pretty much. And then I'm really, really happy with him. So I, vi I just visited his gym like in the last month. And look amazing. He's doing a really good job. He's really, he's really patient. Like what he loves to do, you know, like he loves you. He loves to share. He loves to train. He's really a nice boy. Nice kid. He is. Um, uh, views on this vary a little bit, but you know, traditionally in the traditional martial arts, there's a, a big emphasis put on character development and uh, you know, be, being a, a solid person, not just learning how to fight, you know, but being a better person. And I think Fernando uh, is like that quite a bit. Is that something he gets from you? Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I try. I try to be like Jiu-Jitsu helped me a lot. The, the martial arts helped me like to to be a better person, to to control myself as well. You know, to know the limit, and then I think I try to pass that for my students. So I always try. You know, they see me. I always try to help somebody else. So I, I'm really glad for the people to help me to get here, and then I always try to help somebody else. And then I think Fernando get a little bit of there from me too. I, I saw him always try to you know, know, make somebody else better. He always try to help him. He has a good heart. He yeah. Jiu -jitsu help us to do that. You know, work like it. It's pretty much as a, like a family. You know, if you check the Brazilian top team, is a is a family. So everywhere you go, everybody's like really friendly. All the Brazilian top team schools you go around here. So you're gonna feel at home. Everybody treat you well. You know, everybody try to help you. Not just about training. Not about just technique, but if you need anything outside of the gym, the guys are always ready to help you. Yeah, um, you know, my house got flooded in Hurricane Harvey, and Fernando came over and helped me uh, gut it. And uh, I rented one of those little uh, front end loaders to move the trash around out in the yard. And Fernando drove that front end loader around. He looks so happy driving that. I'm telling you, if he didn't do jujitsu, I think that's what he would have done for a living. But yeah, yeah but he, he's been there for me on a number of occasions, and I appreciate that. Um, yeah, no, yeah, that's what I say. Like he, he really, he, he's happy about to help somebody else. You know, he's, he's feeling good about that, and uh, me too. So it's good. I want to get back to you for a minute. I kind of skipped over. You've had a pretty good uh, competitive career. I know you still compete. Can you tell me uh, maybe some highlights of your competitive career? Some of your more memorable tournaments or matches? Yeah, yes, for sure. So right now. I believe I've been 12, yeah, 12 years as a black belt. So, and then I've been competing as a blue. So, and then I've been starting training harder as a, as a black belt. So when I decide I want to compete, I want to do that. And then I'm still competing. So I try to fight against some injury, you know, get hurt sometimes and get old, getting harder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, try to recover now. Uh, but lately, so... The last, the last good tournament I did was the World No Gi. So I won the set for the second time straight. So I won in 2016, and now I won again 2017, December. Uh, it was a great tournament, tough competitors. I did the, I made the final against Tarsus Humphreys. He's a world champion and he's a really tough guy. So I won by 2-0. It was a good match. And beside that, I've been competing, so I won already, like, the, the Panas no Gi twice. I won uh, the Panas Gi in 2016 as well. Uh, I got a couple couple times couple times the, the, on the podium on the world as well, on Gi, no Gi. Like, two times I got a second place on the Gi, like, two more times on third place on no Gi. And um, beside that, so on the Brazil, competing a lot, too, so the... Brazilian Nationals, a place in a couple times. And then uh, IBJJF Opens, I, I've been competing. I won already like a couple times in Miami, Boston, Austin, Dallas, Houston, Charlotte. So I've been competing all over the United States on the, on the tournaments. So I've been, been really happy about the, about the tournaments lately. And long time competing so you're getting getting more experience you know to do and uh, 
and I love to compete. I love the, the adrenaline to get your, your body, you know, to, to compete. To be honest with you, I, prefer, I like more to compete than training. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you have a, a particular um, strategy you go in with? Do you like to uh, go for the takedown, or, or how, how do you approach a match? So uh, my goal is, is always go to the finish, but I like to work like position by position. So I, I believe it is, it is a kind of old school mentality. So no matter if you're on bottle, start on the bottle, start on top, I feel comfortable on both. But my goal always is get on top and finish from the top. So if I pull the guard, if I start on bottle, I try to sweep, I try to get on top and finish. So if I get on top, I'll be there until the end. So I'll be on top to finish or no move back. So I try always like going forward slowly but surely. No big steps, no big jumps, but whatever like space you get, whatever space you advance it, don't move back. So try to keep the pressure. Nice. I, I like that philosophy. Um, it's been within the last year, I think, you had a, a super fight with uh, Rafael Lovato Jr. Unfortunately, you didn't get the win, but how did the match go? Is that a good experience for you? Yeah, it was a good experience. So, I don't, I don't I think it was uh, last year or the year before. I'm not sure. Which, uh, Rafael Lovato is one of the toughest guys. Man, he's really good. He's been competing, winning a lot. And then uh, I got a short note call. I just want to help out the show, you know, because the guys always support and put my my students to compete. And so the fight to win called me like a week, pretty much like a, um, they call me on Friday to compete in another Friday against Lovato. Right. He, he had an opponent drop out due yeah. to an injury, right? Yeah, he had an opponent drop out. And the, the guys come like a Friday, so like seven days before which I was uh, like traveling with my student was fighting Oklahoma so I was coaching him he was fighting MMA there we stayed there for the weekend which I, I haven't trained on this weekend so I started training back on Tuesday to go fight on Friday <laughs> was a really short notice to, to do it you know, like if I, if I have to fight against somebody good like him I, I really need more more time to train I wouldn't do that again <laughs> Yeah, but got got to say, I got a lot of respect for you to to uh, take a match like that on a week's notice. So uh, that's actually pretty awesome. Yeah, I just want to like, also challenge myself to help the show, but he's you no know, like he is really good. He's really tough, so I need I need to be well prepared to go somebody against him, like him. Right. Uh, speaking of uh, competitions, I see that your students have a competition coming up uh, this weekend. Is that correct? Submission hunter. Yeah, so I got a couple of guys competing in the submission hunter here. I believe it's seven or eight guys doing the super fight from San Antonio. Awesome. Uh, on this Sunday. Awesome. So, so with a lot of students competing, I'm sure you, almost every competition you've got somebody going in for the first time. What advice do you have for students going into their first competition? Yeah, all of the guys like the guys got a little nervous about the, about compete because of the first time. Or sometimes when they go in to compete, uh, like a big tournament, and uh, they're not used it to compete, I always tell the guys, remember, you, you, it's a big tournament, but it's not a big opponent. So you fight against the guy, you don't fight against the tournament. You know, whatever you fight here is the same thing you do in the gym. So try to do everything you do in the gym. So just keep your mind, you know, calm and work, everything will be working. So don't think about how big is the tournament. So think about your opponent. Because, like, no matter if you're doing, like, a small tournament or a big tournament, sometimes the person you fight against is the same. So that's got to, like, be, be, be prepared about the tournament. So especially when the guy saw, oh, IBJJF is a big tournament here, but and then you're going to compete a local tournament, so you have the same guy, so competing. So you just got to be calm and, like, focus on the opponent. Not do don't think about the tournament. So yeah. it's, just, it's just a fight, especially the, the first fight. If you're going to fight a white belt, I told my friend, there's a five minute to fight. So just keep yourself calm. It's going to be faster than you think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's over before you know it. Yeah. I, I wrote that down. I really like that, that uh, you're not fighting against the big tournament. You're fighting against a guy. It, exactly, th that's yeah. great advice. Um, Sometimes you get a, like, a small tournament, you get a tougher opponent than the big tournament. So you never know. Yeah. So you've got to prepare to fight against somebody, no, not against the, the show. Nice. 
Um, at the at the mid level, uh, blue belt, purple belt. When your students are training, uh, what does preparation look like? I've been to some gyms where the mentality seems to be we got to be in the best shape we can, and two weeks out, they're they're doing tons of cardio and tons of strength and conditioning. And then I've seen other schools where we got to be as technical as we can, and it's a lot of drilling and and game planning. Uh, where do you fall on that spectrum? Well. At the, at the level like blue and the purple belt, I believe you have to be training all the time. You know, of course you have to have a goal, so you, you're gonna shoot your goal. So that's the tournament you wanna go. If you wanna go to Worlds, if you wanna do that, so I tell the guys you gotta prepare yourself to get the uh, the tournament, the biggest tournament you want for the year, best you can. So the other tournaments gonna prepare you to get there, so to make to fix the mistakes. So I always tell the guys, so if you wanna be a world champion, you cannot just compete the worlds one time a year because over there you're going to have some mistakes you didn't fix it so try to compete like step by step you're going to compete once twice a month and then from there you get your mistakes fixed from once to get in the big tournament you can have no mistake so but I always tell, yeah i always tell you guys so gotta always prepare so be training keep training keep training but don't overtrain. So uh, you're gonna train like five, six times a week, and at least one day you're gonna rest for complete. Right. So, so you threw out there casually uh, compete once or twice a month. If if a guy's blue purple belt and he really wants to to make a splash on the competitive scene, you're telling him to compete as much as they can. Yeah, as much as he can, but you will be careful too. Sometimes you compete too much, you can get. You can get like hurt, or you can take over your training to compete. So, I told the guys also the number of competitors per month is like it's good. Like if you do like twice a month, no more than that will be too much, I believe. It. Yep, that sounds like a pretty good pace. Yeah, I go once, twice a month. That's perfect. Like you don't have to push harder than this. Right. So let me ask you a few questions that uh, might inform some of our listeners, might help some guys out. Uh, for, for white belts that are just starting out, what do you think the most important things are that they need to be focusing right out of the gate? Well, the white belts, I believe they have to know very well the, the basic positions, you know, like the fundamentals. So they have to have a good base to start learning like everything else. So you don't, if you don't have a good base, like you will, won't be good to do like some like advanced positions or some crazy stuff. So... I always focus on the base. So I even I even myself when I drill I just drew the I pretty much drew the base. So I try to keep simple. And that's what I try to pass to my students. So especially for the beginners, so they have to work a lot like full guard, dunbar, basic position, mount. So you I like to to show you how to control the opponent. So I don't wanna you be wide jumping around, you know, I wanna like you know where you're moving, you know where your opponent is going to move. And to have the control is learning the basics. When you get a new student come in with no grappling experience, do you uh, just kind of put them in the class and, and let them go, or do you have a, a little bit of a private with them first or have an upper belt work with them? How, how do you handle that situation? So right here in my gym, you have like a beginner's class. So when you start, your first week, you're going to do the beginner's class only. And then you're going to get all the, the fundamentals from there. And after that, you're going to start by going do the advanced class, but you're still going to the beginner. So you just can do one more class if you want to. So you can do, it, do the beginners, and then you go to the, to the advanced. So once you go to the advanced, he's going to work more with the high belts. So you know, I, don't, I don't like to put beginners to roll it together so they, they can get hurt easily. Yeah, that, uh, that can be a recipe for disaster, for sure. Yeah, exactly. I like to put a high belt, especially in the first row. The first time they're going to sparring, the, the guy has to be rolling with somebody like high belt to let him roll, to control him, to tell him what to do, what to not do, and pretty much that. But for sure, the guy has to be a beginner's class. You know, like, cannot throw somebody never did before on the uh, like a high level class so he's gonna slow down if you throw him there he's gonna slow down the class and he will learn and he won't learn anything anyways 
Right. How, how many people are you averaging in your beginner's class right now? So, yeah, the average is going to 20 people in the class for the beginners. Oh, man, that's a big class. Yeah, it's going to be 15 to 20, depends of the day. I got to make it up there to see you one of these days. <laughs> for sure, my friend. More than welcome. Yeah. Um, when a student's getting close to blue belt, uh, some schools actually have blue belt tests. Do you, do you have tests for belt ranks? I do. I do have the test. So I, uh, I give the list. I made my students stood, prepared themselves to do the test for all the belts. So I think they have to know not just how to do, but they have to know how to teach. How, I wanna, they explain to me what they do and why they do it. So it's very fun when you when you is getting close to the, the test belt here. You see the guys like in, they are in the school, you no, know, literally. So, so they came early to the class. They try to learn. They try to 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 take the, the all the details from the highest belt. You know that they stay after the class. They they really try to improve to do the test. But once you do that, it's like in school. You study a lot to do the test. After the test, you're gonna know everything because you force yourself to learn. And then this came natural. And then I. I like the I like the idea. I really I really think it's fun. And then when I, I promote somebody, I give the belt. I don't want to just make a fighter. You know, I want the guy be able to cheat to help somebody else. I always tell the guy like, "I get a belt here, more you have to help." So, if you blue belt, now gonna help gonna help gonna have to help all the white belts. So if you're purple, have to help all the blue and the white. If you're brown, gonna help. Brown, purple, blue, and the white. If you're black, gonna help everybody. So the guy had to know how to teach, how to pass, you know, and not just come here and be tough and rolling. Nice. C- can you give me some examples of what's on the blue belt test? Well, like I said, it's a basic, it's a very fundamental position. So the guy has to know how to break guard, how to pass. So all the submissions from the mount. Submissions from the full guard, so side control, submission from the side control. He have to know how to escape from the other position, so how to escape from the bar, how to escape from side control, how to escape from the chokes. You know, some some position like a headlock and self defense. So you you have to be knowing well a little bit of that. I have a question for you that's a, a little bit different and. Um... Mm-hmm. If uh, if you came and visited the school that I train at in Louisiana and we all put on white belts and you didn't know what our ranks were and I told you there was two black belts in the class, I think we've got a brown belt, a couple of good purple belts. If we're all wear- wearing white belts, what would you be looking for if, if I asked you to try and guess who the black belts were, who the brown belts were? Other than just winning a match, what kind of things would you look at that you'd say that that guy's a better grappler than the other guy? Well, yeah, first of all, like, you, you're going to see the guy who, like, is a kind of mindset who's going to be more calm to roll, who's going to be more calm, you know, like, patient to do the right timing. So once you, you see the rolling, you, you can feel it. You can see, you know, whoever, like, go more wild, whoever go more calm, you know, have more control of the, of the, the fight, of the match. I think more experience you get, like, Calm, more calm you get, so you have a better control of the. You don't try just to scramble and roll over. You know? So l- less about technique and more just about uh, the way you're approaching the match. Yeah, the technique is came together for sure, but like uh, just the way you, you can see, you can feel the guy just the way you start to fight. You know which which is pretty much his level. You know the way he's rolling, the way he's moving. You can, you can see. Nice. You can see what his level it is. Um, it seems like uh, in in most schools, if you go to the adult class, probably 75, 80% of the class is going to be men between the ages of 18, 19, and maybe 35. And then the other 20 or so is going to be some older guys and, and maybe some women. And so if, if you're an older guy, I, I'm older, there are some unique challenges. Uh, what what advice do you have for old guys? Like a guy comes in, he's fifty years old, and he's a white belt. Well, I would say that the jiu-jitsu is, is very, it's very good sport. It's very good martial art because you, you develop the jiu-jitsu 
for your body type, for yourself. You know, you make the game for yourself. I always say that I don't try to copy anybody, especially like if you're big, you cannot try to copy a, a small guy game. So, the, 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 like I say, the point is everybody got to learn the, the fundamentals, and from there you're going to develop what is easier for you to do, what your body can do with. But with the guys older, like I, like you, myself, so I've been getting older, and then my game is changing. It's not the same thing I used to do when it was like 20 years ago, you know, jumping, moving like crazy. But right now, like I always say, man, you you older, so try to move slowly, you know, like try to control your opponent. They're pretty much my game, so I try to control, I try to, I push the pace, you know. If you want to go fast, I go fast. If you want to go slow, I'm going to hold him down, you're going to move slow. So you cannot lose the control if you, you're always going to fight your game. You know, if you fight somebody else's game, if you play somebody else's game, so is me, you're pretty much gonna lose. So you're gonna push the pace, put the speed you want to, and uh, find the control from there. Right. Slowly but surely. Yeah, I think uh, Bruce Lee said that uh, if two fighters face each other and they've got a fairly equal skill set, the one that controls the uh, timing and the pace and the distance is gonna win the fight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I, I noticed you have a, a woman's only class. Uh, tell me a little bit about that, how many women you have in it, how, how that's going. Yeah, so you have a, you have a lot of women here in the gym. And, and then now we start building the woman class. To be honest, it's good for the, the, the woman when he first, she first get here, when they first get here in the gym. They're not comfortable to, to do a class with our men. But after a while, so the girls are very tough. They want to challenge you. So they don't want to ruin the girls anymore. They want to you know, go harder. And they started coming to the regular class. I believe the women's class is good like to, to do like for the beginner girls. So after that, they want to come to the other. I have like the, the advanced class here. Sometimes I have 10 girls training together with men. So they, they want to go hard too. So <laughs> they don't like to just roll with the girls. Nice. And, and, and your wife trains, is that correct? Yeah, my wife's trained too. She's a blue belt. Nice. Uh, do, you, do you teach the women's class? I do not. I have, I have a, I, I put this time to, just to put girls together because I, I believe that like if you put the girls' class and the men teaching will be not the same thing or just girls is getting together. I have my student, Julie, she's teaching the... the She's a purple belt for stripe, and she's teaching the the women's class here every nice. so once a week. Just girls on the mat, so it's Friday. Nice. And, and, to build now. and then most of the girls go to another class or two at the open class. Yeah, the most of the girls going to their the other class. Nice. Um, they came in more to their normal class than the women's. <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> awesome. Um, and how about uh, kids? You got a good kids program. Yes, now your kids' program is getting really, really good. So the kids' class getting full, and they've been competing. They've been doing so well. They just had the Naga right here last next last weekend, and they have like around ten kids competing. So we all got medals and sure. So <laughs> it was really, really good to see. So we start the class like four years old. So and they start from little. Boy, that can be a handful of four-year-olds on the mat, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they're getting crazy. But to have always, like, at least, like, three coats during the class, or two, three coats in the, during the class to take care of the kids. So yeah. it is, it's hard to be yourself, by, just by yourself with 20 kids running around. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you got to have an adult for every five or six kids, it seems like. Yeah. Uh, do you yeah. use that as an opportunity to, for somebody like your blue belts to get started teaching? Yeah, so I have like my, I always tell the guys like in my brown belt, I, I like they help me to teach. So because I, I want to, they learn how to teach. So once they get a black belt, they, they be ready to, to teach by their own. And also I ask you like always somebody if have time, like purple belt or blue, to help them to teach, you know, to see how they teach or, you know, to come to the class together and to just pay attention. So I has, a, I has my brown belt, Sergio, he's been teaching the kids class too. And I have a purple and blue belt to ask you to go to help him and to see him teaching 
to see how you can teach that too, you know. And I believe when you start to teach, you learn a lot. I start to teach, you know, and uh, after that I start learning more because I have to uh, to remember all the details, to show everybody, and uh, I start to remember the details to do when I was rolling, which helped me a lot. And then I, I believe they help the guys to grow up the game, especially to understand better the, the basic position when you know all the details to show. Uh, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of focus these days on bullying. In your kids' program, uh, do you spend time anti-bullying, and, and how do you approach that topic? Yeah, so you try to, to what do one work here, the jiu-jitsu, you try to build build the self-esteem of the kid, you know, to make him more confident, the way he has, like, no problem with the bully. And I have a, a lot of parents came here to ask me about the, you know, the kid having bullying in the school. And after they start, they pretty much came natural. So they started training, they started getting involved with the other kids. So they started getting better in the school. They started getting like better grades. They started like don't get any problems with the bully anymore because they they really built the self esteem, the self confidence they have is very very good. Man. I believe all the kids should start to do jiu-jitsu early as can as possible. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, you, you said something about the parents, and that kind of reminded me. I, I've seen parents at uh, tournaments that some do it well and some do not do it very well. They get uh, over-anxious and, and hollering at their kids and stuff. What advice do you have for parents who are getting kids into jiu-jitsu and their kids are competing? Yeah, as always, uh, I have some... I had some problems in on the past too. So the parents, some parents get like too serious about the training, you know, some parents I always tell them like the kids have to have fun, you know, like don't push, don't make this a mandatory, you have to go jiu jitsu, you have to do this. So it's not fun for the kid when he's not not more like a, not playing more. So if you look at this as a job, you gotta do it four four years old, you have a job to do, like it's not fun. I tell the parents, so they have to come here, they have to have the fun, they have to learn, so they have to behave, but don't push the hard. You know, if you think about your your, your son going to be a world champion four years old, and you think this is going to change his life, I'm going to tell you not. It doesn't make any difference for your son be a world champion as a four years old and not. You know, like, sooner or later, if you push too hard, he, he's going to stop. You're going to get tired of that. So you're going to let him get involved. You're going to let him have fun and just like learning, learning, and then let him want to do, you know. So most have to come from him. You bring him to the gym, let him have fun, and after that he's going to ask to come back. So that's that's my goal when the, when the kids are happy here and they want to come back next day. And these are happy a lot here. They, they want to stay all day in the gym. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that, that's excellent advice. I knew a kid who wrestled in uh... – well, he wrestled from the time he was five years old up through high school, won a couple state championships, uh, could have been a great college wrestler. But, man, his parents pushed him so hard. He went off to college. He never wrestled a day again after his senior year in high school. So uh, that's great advice. Keep yes, it fun. Exactly. And- yeah, I, I saw this a lot. And you know, I have a lot of guys. So they, I have a lot of kids. They started. They could be good. And the parents pushed too hard, you know, getting a hard time to train harder and, and they, they cry all the time in the class and they they don't do well because like they are afraid to lose because they know the parents will be mad and then once you're afraid to lose you're afraid to try so you don't try your best because you're afraid to fall and then start getting everything wrong so just let her have fun no commitment just keep training having fun so once you get older the age like 15 16 years old then so he's ready to know like whatever he want to do if you really want to do that, but you cannot decide your, the future of your kid, you know, like don't, a lot of, a lot of parents, they try to live their own dreams on the kids. So the kids have to have their own dream. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, Diego, before we uh, wrap things up completely, um, you have a DVD series you put out recently called the invisible arm bar. And you actually came down to our school and did a, uh, seminar on it i was thoroughly impressed you want to talk about that for a second before we're done oh yeah for sure man so uh, yeah i just have this seminar the 
sorry, the, the DVD, just record the DVD with the, with the BGJ fanatics. So the Invisible Armbar is the, is the, is the move I really, really like to do it because the guy don't expect it. I call it Invisible Armbar because like they don't see it until the, the, the army gets completely straight. So, and then I've been doing like a seminar with the top. I went there in Lake Jackson to do this one too. And this, this, uh, like I say, a position I, I, I learned and I developed to, to my body weight, to my way to fight. Like I say, I always try to keep the control. Once I get a good position, I don't let it go anymore. And then they pretty much start from the third position or like side control. You know, I, I developed like a lot of ways to get on there. But I like a lot to work from the turtle before you take the back because that is the time the guy trying to escape and then you you catch him. So what I try to do there, like give him an opportunity to try to escape and then you catch him. So the invisible one but I start I start to do that more once I came to United States actually. So when I came over to United States I start to teach and they have a lot of wrestlers. I've been teaching challenge of uh, you know, at the gym with the, a lot of wrestlers came to the class. They want to roll, they want to try. And then I started seeing the guys like shooting the single leg for everywhere. They, whatever they do, if they on bottle, they try to get the single leg, they try to get the bow leg. So that, that's what the guys do. And then I started lock the arm from there. Once they shoot the single, I lock the arm and then I went straight to the, the arm bar. And they being very useful on that and started like applying the tournaments and then I get a, I get a, like a lot of submission the tournaments with this. So for sure I have to send you a DVD too. I have yours here. Awesome. Yeah, I'll give it a good review. Um, I think one thing that uh, indicates whether or not uh, people like the technique you show in a, in a seminar is how much you see it in class afterwards. And I've had about a half a dozen guys in Lake Jackson try and catch me with that since you showed it. So it, it's catching on. Yeah. Every, everybody likes it. Yeah, so it, because the, the truth is really, really simple. You just have to understand, you know, and then get the time. Once you understand the position, get the time, it's really simple to do. Like everybody can do it. If you're small, if you're big, if you're old, if you're young, like it's a simple position. So I like to work the position, which is easy to do. I always tell the guys, like whenever you're drilling, whenever you're learning, you cannot use any strength to learn the position, new position. So if you use a strength to learn the position, to do the technique, because it's not, it's not right. So you gotta do the technique without any strength. And then when you find a way to do the technique, you're gonna start a user string on the right way. Don't expend your energy to do a lot of energy, a lot of string in the wrong way to get there. So and that's a one of that. So once you lock, you get the arm, you lock the arm bar, so you just push. You know, pretty much like you pull the trigger. You got everything ready, whenever he moves, you pull the trigger and done. It's very simple. Right, and and, and through the, and through the whole process, you're sort of protecting your dominant position. So if, if things start to fail, you could just go back to your strong side control or wherever you were at. Correct? Exactly, exactly. Like I say in the beginning, like other positions I do, once I advance, I get a good position. I won't move back from there. I can move forward, but I won't move back. You know, and they try to finish, nothing works, so stay there. Like you say, like you side control, you try to finish. I don't want to uh, risk a. Uh, uh, crazy submission and lose the good position I have. I fight hard to get there. I don't want to do something crazy and lose everything. So I mean, side control because I get a good, I, I fight hard to get there. So I'm going to try to submit from there without to get any risk for me. So I keep in the control. So I try to submit, nothing work. I want to keep inside control. Would you describe your game as a, a tight game or a loose game? So it's kind of tight. You no, know, like, I like to be close and pressure, so I like to move. I like to work a lot, a lot of body weight. Right. Okay. I like to make my opponent care my body. Perfect. Which make it make it like waste his energy. Whenever he move, he have to move myself first, and then he's gonna start to move, and then I'm gonna know where he's gonna move. So which make me faster than him. Perfect. 
Before we uh, finish up here, is there anybody you'd like to give a shout out to? Well, man, I was glad, like, you know, like my students helped me a lot here in the gym. So I've been traveling to do seminars a lot lately, competing. So they can help me a lot in the gym. And I'm really, really glad with the growing of the BT team in Texas. Nice. And then uh, soon, soon we'll be in Texas to, to grand opening of the new one and Sugar Land. Oh, nice. So it's going to be the newest BT team in Texas. Very Probably good. Probably May. Yeah, you decide you're still seeing the, the day yet. So we're going to be a party grand opening. So a lot of black belts teaching the class there. You must go. Yep, I'll put that on my calendar when you come up with the date. Yeah, so and then I'm really happy with the, the all the BTT schools here in Texas. You can see like all the schools are like getting bigger, fuller. So everybody's doing well. You've been placing the all the IBJJF tournaments. You've been the BTT being placed in here in Texas. Always getting trophy, team trophy. So the team's getting very strong. And uh, just glad with the, all the all the help. You like you, like I say, like you try to work here, but everybody together, you know, stronger together. So when the podcast comes out, we'll put a link um, to BTT Texas and to San Antonio so people can get a hold of you. Uh, you're available for seminars if anybody's interested, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'll be available. Yeah. Or seminar after June. I mean, uh, April, May, I cannot do anymore. <laughs> You're pretty well booked up for the next couple of months, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. But after June, I'll be good to go. Okay. All right, Diego. Uh, again, man, I really appreciate you coming on. It's uh, pretty late in the evening, and you took time after class for us, and, and I thank you very much. Thank you, my friend. Always a pleasure. So I'll be waiting for you to visit me here. And then, anyways, May, you'll be there in Sugar Land. Yeah, perfect. I'd like to thank Diego for being on the show. Uh, it was a pleasure spending an hour talking to him. If you're interested in learning more about him or following him, check out the show notes, and uh, we'll have links there that you can follow. And I was going to say, if you're in San Antonio, yeah, definitely stop by the gym and uh, learn from a, a legend like Diego. There you go. Yep. Thank you, Diego. Uh, we also have, instead, uh, you know, usually at the end of the show, We'll do an article of the week, but this time we have a question because this is the extra episode and we can just run it a little differently. I feel like I'm re- repeating that, but uh, don't want anybody to be wondering where the article is. But this, we have a question here. What are some things you can do to slow somebody down? Tranquilizers. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That's that's true, I guess. Um it it depends on what's happening and where they're getting their speed from. I think, I think if closed guard is being a great way to take a deep breath, and they have to do something before they're out of it right away. Even a lot of times, half guard slows people down, but not quite as much as a as a closed guard. Any positions that you think that you could just kind of, I guess I'm looking at more of a neutral position versus you know get mount or get the guys back. Uh, because those may be hard to get to, but uh, think of any other neutral positions or maybe techniques that really help slow somebody down. Yeah, I think uh, sort of techniques and postures, even within those positions, um, if you're playing closed guarded and you're not uh, breaking their posture down and doing it in a way that it's harder for them to get their posture back than it is for you to keep it broken, you got to use good technique. So things like a good collar grip, uh, an overhook, um, you know, those kind of things, and you're making them work hard to try and get back the space they need to move. Yeah, I agree with you, Joe, there. That's kind of what I was going to say. It's, you know, overhooks. You know, I like to use an underhook a lot of times, especially in half guard. You know, really tight control on the waist. Uh, you know, make the spine mechanically weak. You know, try to turn the head, try to turn the spine, and, uh, you know, just stay tight. And uh, that's one way I, I can uh, try to slow somebody down. So speed to me is the same thing as uh, strength. It's just an attribute that somebody has. And if, they, if they're if they fast and they're using that speed, it's much. It's kind of similar to somebody who's strong and they're using their strength. That's fine. It's it's something that, that may not be there all the time for you. Typically, I think of the, the younger and smaller people 
being at the higher end of the speed, but that's not necessarily true either. If you you know really work on things and in, in, in your game implement speed a lot, you could do techniques lightning fast, and you could you know be up there kind of closer to Gary's age, and and still be pretty fast. Well, it's now that you brought age into this, <laughs> and um, but you know that's one thing I've noticed as I've got older, I'm definitely a lot slower. You know, I I think I'm moving in slow motion compared to some of these people I see, but so that's one thing I'm always trying to do is slow people down because I can't keep up with that, and I notice I've got to crowd that person. I've got to be touching that person. I, I can't leave space for that person to just run circles around me, literally. I have to be close. I have to be touching, uh, kind of like what Joe said. I'm looking for hooks. And, and when I say hooks, I'm looking for an overhook. I'm looking for an underhook. I'm looking for a collar tie. I'm looking for anything to keep body against body and you know as little space as possible between us where I'm not going to allow that person in his comfort zone where they can use their speed against me. You know, these are, are techniques, I guess, that you can use to uh, slow somebody's movements. But I think another way to look at it is to just slow them down by emptying their gas tank faster than you're emptying yours. Good and point. I think that's that's just about uh, using better technique than them so that they're working harder to try and get what they want than you're having to work to get what you want. So... Um, yeah, I really think, uh, technique using good frames, um, and that sort of stuff will go a long ways. If you, if you do get top position, uh, really concentrate on some pressure, some shoulder pressure and, uh, use good mechanics. You know, uh, Byron thinking about this question is what are some things you can do to slow someone down? And we're talking about in the heat of the moment in a, in a sparring match, how to slow it down. But I'm also wondering, you know, I don't, I don't know if they ask you this question in person or, or you talked about the question, but I'm wondering if the question can be, you know, kind of like the spaz in the class you're rolling and somebody, you know, just goes a little too hard, goes a little too fast. And you're trying to slow that person down a little bit. So they'll learn a little bit better. So it'll be more enjoyable for you. Um, you know, that could be, the question too. Do you, did you talk to the person? Is this a question somebody asked you? Was it online? Did they really tell you how that, what they were talking about when they asked about slowing somebody down? Gary, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, if you want to send in questions for this segment, send them to bjbrick at gmail.com or you could send them, you know, through our Facebook fan page. I made this question up because I didn't have a question oh. this week. And I think okay. it's an interesting concept and, it could be any of those things. I think sometimes with the with the kind of the more spazier person uh, talking to them, and it doesn't have to be the the asking them this sort of all you though you could. It could just be talking about things while you're rolling, and and letting them know that this isn't that death match that, that sometimes Gary brings to the table, and he's he's won most of his death matches, but he hasn't won them all. Yeah, I'm fifteen, thirteen, and seven yeah. in matches to the death. That's actually your locker combination back in high school. <laughs> <laughs> so you were the one always breaking in <laughs> and stealing my Yeah, lunch. when I was a kindergartner. Oh. Yep. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, but, oh, man. <laughs> just <Basinga>. having, <laughs> <laughs> having some kind of a, of a thing to say or to take the intensity down a notch is okay. And if it's, if it's somebody that you roll with and they go super fast and you, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like it's okay to learn how to deal with somebody's speed, but if you would rather not, maybe just not today, or maybe you feel that they're injury prone to you, uh, save them for the last round and they'll probably be a little slower. And that's not really a technique thing, but it's, it might make your class more enjoyable if you don't have to go with the speedy person on the first roll, try to try to let them work themselves out a little bit. But you know, it's not a bad thing to have, people with that speed i think what joe mentioned you know, let them try themselves out you know i uh, along the same lines is don't work quite as hard maybe give up some you, you know and then take it back later on like if they're going to pass your guard super fast at least make sure that when they do you you have your hands or your arms in the right position and you're able to shrimp and get it back and so your recovery is there uh don't try to match speed for speed especially if you're having a problem with that because that's 
That's not going to be a thing you you win. It's like trying to go up against a real big guy who wants to muscle you. You you can't just match muscle for muscle. Uh, if you would have been doing that, this person would have been muscling you anyway. L- look for areas that you could that you could uh, work your technique and 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 catch up later on when they take that breath or when you're able to shrimp and recover your guard back. And yeah, let them work a little harder is fine. But uh, don't try to match them speed for speed. I think that's a mistake. And the thing about the person going super fast all the time, that's one benefit that, that I know I've talked about myself is it's good to sit out a round or two and watch people roll and talk to the people who are rolling. If you see the new person going 100 miles an hour or even the blue belt who's trying to smash the other person or whatever, uh, you know, tell them to slow down. And that's easier to do from a third-party perspective versus the grappler having that, hey, slow down, man, you're, you're going too fast for me. But as a coach from the sideline saying that, it's a little easier for that person to hear and a little easier on the person who's uh, rolling with that person. It's just a, it's nice having that third party. I don't sit out enough, uh, but I do see a lot of value with that. You know, uh, you talk about slowing down the new guy or the guy that's maybe a little spastic to the point where they could injure you. I have employed a strategy multiple times. It's worked every time. Usually when guys are, are spazzing a little bit and I'm worried I could get hurt, it's when they – see a glimmer of space to try and get to my back or uh, or they see a submission they can explode into. And I always pause the match and I tell them, I'm not trying to win here. If you get in position to take my back, I'm not going to fight to the death to uh, prevent you from getting that position. You earned it. You can have it. I said, if you get an arm bar set up correctly, I'm not going to fight to the death to prevent it. You got You set it up correctly. You earned it. You got it. And then when I roll with them, I prove that to be true. You know, if, the, if they're going to get a submission on me, I don't spaz out then to try not to tap to a new guy. Joe, that's great advice. And that's kind of what, like what I was going to say. I, if I'm in that position, normally they do spaz when all of a sudden they think they can pass the guard and, and take the arm or something else. And, you know, they're spazzing because they're really going for that submission. And I, I do the same thing. And I've noticed that's, that works a little bit, even though it didn't work today. But... I will let people finish that submission, get that submission, and I won't spaz to get out. I will, I will let them, you know, get the tap. And uh, and I think once they see that you're going to roll smooth, you're going to allow some stuff to happen. It seems like I don't get hit by as many flying knees and flailing elbows as I as I did previously. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's good advice. So it's not all technique. Some of it's social. Uh, of course, that's not going to work super well in a tournament. But <laughs> it, I mean, if you're worried about training in, in your safety or their safety, you're li- a lot more likely to get hurt by a new guy going fast than a more experienced person going at a regular speed. That's just that those are injury prone situations. Yeah, and you know, just talking is very smart too. Like I, the guy that I rolled with that I said didn't work out too well today, but. You know, right before he rolled, he's like, "Hey, let's go really slow. I just want to to work." And and uh, it didn't turn out like that. It started out like that, and uh, boy, it was uh, crazy. But afterwards, you know, I I did have a talk with him about you know. Actually, I had two rounds where I had a talk with him, and then very at the very end, he came up to apologize to me, and and he said it was nervous energy. You know, he is newer, and he hasn't been around in a little bit, and. You know, I think he might have been scared. And, and, you know, then I just talked again. I was like, have I ever really grabbed an arm and, and yanked on it against you? There's no reason to be nervous. If we roll smooth, I'm going to let you go everywhere you want to go. We're going to work. And uh, I'm going to work on escaping. You're going to work on positions. You're going to work on some submissions. And we're just going to roll smooth like that. And uh, both of us are going to go to our job on Monday. There, there's a lot to be learned here. Some of it's technique. And, like, I know with Gary – uh, technique wise, uh, being in no gi, you know, overhook, underhook, those help things. Uh, with the gi on, you know, grabbing that collar, grabbing a sleeve, that slows people down. I mean, I, I do think the gi game is a slower game anyway. That's not a, a real bold statement to say. <laughs> so you're saying, like, if you got somebody really fast that you're trying to slow down and you're in no gi, say, hey, let's put the gi on. Is that what you're saying? That's that's I or say to him, you get roll. more into hair pulling. No, I think I mean the overhook. If you're on the bottom, uh, really can slow things down a little bit. Yeah, I tell you, I was rolling uh, today, and uh, I was in somebody's guard, and they worked a really strong overhook, and 
and you know it's hard to limp arm out you know you have to worry because your posture like joe was saying earlier is being broken down i got to worry about a triangle coming up and uh yeah it was uh really slowed the game down well normally when i'm rolling the game slowed down because i'm slow as death yeah and also gary prefers to put some slow music on <laughs> and that just naturally <laughs> brings the tone down a little bit no that's only when i'm rolling with you byron is that or is that a little it? al green yep. and yeah <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. It's, every episode is getting awkward. <laughs> but if you want to enjoy some awkwardness, come train with us. We do have the BJJ Brick event, but uh, you're, you're welcome anytime. Uh, really, we'll, we'll do our best to get uh, some mat time with you if you're anywhere near us. Having to be traveling through. Gary and I are in Wichita, Kansas. Send us an email or hit us on Facebook. Same thing with Joe. Joe, where are you located? I'm just south of Houston, so if you're in the Houston area, let me know. I do spend some time around New Orleans, a pretty good bit of time. So if you're over in southeast Louisiana, let me know. I'd love to train with you. And if nothing else, maybe I can point you towards a good gym. And you know the crazy thing there, Byron? You said if you want to have some awkwardness while training, come train with me and you. (laughs) I don't think a lot of people are going to take that up. So, Joe, I think you're going to get busy. (laughs) No, I I really enjoy it when people come through and and get some mat time with us and tell uh, tell us, you know, tell me where you're from and how long you've been listening. What, how'd you find the show? It's always kind of fun, and I do my best to partner up with the person and do the techniques with them, and and uh, definitely get some rounds of rolling in as well. Have fun doing that every time, guys. I want to mention quickly our Patreon uh, campaign, Patreon page. I don't know what it is. We've got two new supporters. We have Christopher and Paul. Thanks, guys, for signing up and. And support us on Patreon. Uh, what Paul and Christopher are doing is every time an episode comes out, they're, they're pledging a dollar of support. And at the end of the month, I think it's actually towards the beginning of the next month, uh, your card or whatever will be charged that amount of dollars, uh, depending on how many episodes uh, we put out. Uh, it means a ton to us. Our Patreon has really uh, done a lot better lately. Uh, we're looking to continue to grow the show, make this as professional as we can, and and really produce the best show that we possibly can and, and get um, more and more things done with the website and the show. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, when you sign up on Patreon, we'll send you a 5-inch BJJ Brick Gi Patch and a sticker. You're also uh, happily invited to our Facebook private group. I can't find everybody every time. Uh, so Facebook is sometimes a little tricky, but if, if your name is, I don't know, Gary Hall... I can't necessarily find that person on Facebook and track them down. So if you sign up on the uh, Patreon page and you want to become part of the private Facebook group, send me an email, bjjbrook at gmail.com, and put a link to your Facebook page or let me know how to find you on that page. I generally will search Facebook and look for people with your last name or your, you know, looks- I guess your full name and look for somebody wearing a gi or something like that. But that doesn't, <laughs> I mean, my Facebook page, I don't have a gi on the, on the main page and, and uh, as, it's crazy because you wear a gi just about everywhere you go. Yeah. I, I, so the one time I'm not, you get a, I get a picture taken, and that's that's a big deal yeah. to me. But uh, we're really happy to have people in that group, and, and we'll get interview questions for our guests that come on from there sometimes. And if we need an opinion on something, like how's this logo look, or what do you guys think of this? A lot of times I'll throw it up on there and get the kind of the group ideas about it. So uh, thank you, guys, and especially thank you to Christopher and Paul. Yep, thank you, we, Christopher and Paul. We appreciate it. Yeah, we really appreciate the support. Another way you can support us is by checking us out on social media. When you like our posts, share our posts, uh, that just gets more exposure to the show, and we appreciate that. We're busy on Facebook. Byron's got a YouTube channel he's pretty active on. And don't forget to download the BJJ Brick app. It's the easiest way to make sure you get the episodes as they come out. Had a great time this week, gentlemen, and and all the listeners. Thanks for uh, checking this out. Uh, Have an interview next week with Lawrence Griffiths. He runs the website bjjstrength.com. We have a a lot of great conversations about, you know, off the mat training and that sort of thing. He is a black belt under Hodger Gracie, and uh, he's got some really cool ideas as far as competing, off the mat training, and, uh, you know, doing your best. And it was, a, it was a thrill to talk to him and bring the interview to you guys coming up very shortly. Well, as always, stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. 
Train hard, train smart, get better. We'll see you on the mats, guys. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Thanks so much for checking out this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Check us out next week. And don't forget to check out the archives at bjbrick.com or on this YouTube channel.